As you may have guessed, and especially if you read your bulletin, the title of the sermon is Give of Your Best to the Master. Now, that's not the American way. You know, uh, we were talking uh, Friday and Steve Richards said, you know, we, we shouldn't be striving for perfection. We should be striving for excellence. And I agree wholeheartedly with Steve. That's what we ought to be doing is being in the pursuit of excellence. But that's not how we're raised as Americans. Instead, we strive for mediocrity. I mean, think about it from even if you made a New Year's resolution this year. Uh, did you make a New Year's resolution to take something that you do really, really good and to do it better? Well, no, probably not. More than likely, what you did was you said, I'm good enough in this area. What I need to do is take a look at the things I'm failing at, not doing very good, and make a New Year's resolution about that. So we take things that we're really not talented in and blessed with, and we're going to make it better than it was. And, and so what we're really good at, we don't pay much attention to. What we're really poor at, we try to bring it up to the middle ground. That's striving for mediocrity. And the very same thing is true oftentimes in our relationship to God. We're just striving to get by, striving for mediocrity. We're not striving for excellence. We're not striving to give of our best to the master. Oftentimes, what we find is that we may very likely be giving him our leftovers. Well, let's find out what God says about our relationship to him and what he wants from us. Starting in the book of Proverbs, the third chapter with verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Well, more than likely, this is speaking to agriculture, uh, a, a farmer. He was talking about barns being full and vats overflowing with new wine. And you know, for a new Christian, they look at this as an equation. If I do this, then this is what I get. I like what this is over here, therefore I am going to do this. You know, but as you mature as a Christian, you get to the place to where you should realize that that's automatic. You don't even need to concentrate on this. It should be instead, what's pleasing to my heavenly Father? What does God, will he be pleased with me about? That should be the question that we ask. So we, we put verse 10 on the side burner here, and, and we look at what he says in verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Well, how do you do that? I mean, how do, you, how do you honor the Lord with your possessions? Most people get possessions so that they can possess them, but they don't understand the reason for possession. In the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, Paul writes to the church there and tells them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, let those who steal, steal no more. Rather, let them labor that they may have so that they can give to those who have need. Well, now that's a paradigm shift for an American populace. We don't work so that we can have so that we can give away. We work so that we can have and so we can keep it. We can possess it. And I think if you take that principle Paul shared in the book of Ephesians and turn it around and apply it here, then all of a sudden we begin to see that God gives us our possessions so that we can honor him with them. Whether it's our car, our house, our toys, it doesn't make any difference what it is. We can honor God by using it for the kingdom's sake. We can use it for the spreading of the gospel message. We can use it for issues of salvation. So when he says, honor the Lord with your possessions, that's exactly what he expects. Does this sound like a suggestion to you? Or does this not sound like something God says, this is the way that I want it done? Honor the Lord with your possessions. Also talks about first fruits here of all your increase. And as I said earlier, it's probably referring to a farming situation because it's referring to the, the, our vats and, and to our barns. But it's not just that that God expects to be first in our lives regarding Him. In the book of Exodus, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 28, up until now, he's been talking about the relationship to their neighbors, their society. He's going to shift gears now and talk about God. And he says, you shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Now, that's a pretty important thing because that's repeated again in the New Testament. We shouldn't be cursing government. We shouldn't be cursing rulers. We should instead be praying for them. But that's not the point of what we're talking about here. Verse 29 says, you shall not delay to offer the first... 
not the leftovers, not the middle part, but the first of your ripe produce and your juices. Well, now that doesn't apply to us a whole lot. And then it goes on. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Well, you know, I, I, I'm the firstborn son in, in our family. I never thought that I was set aside for God's service. It was after a good long time of me being in the ministry, someone shared this verse with me, that being the firstborn, my parents should have given me to the Lord for the Lord's use and the Lord's work. Because in the old covenant, God expected the first to be given to him. goes on in verse 30, Likewise, you shall do with your oxen, or we, we relate to that as cattle, and your sheep, it shall be with its mother seven days. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. You see, the first of everything that he's talking about here belongs to God. In the book of Proverbs, it said, The first fruits of your increase belong to God. Here he goes on to elaborate upon what is first and the expectation that God has of that belonging to him. Well, we can understand kind of what it means to give the firstborn of our sons to him, but what does it mean about the cattle and the oxen? How do you give them to the Lord after the seven days with their mother? More than likely, the seven days they're talking about from a mother's point of view because she's got an udder full of milk and she needs to be rid of that, needs to have some of the pressure taken off. So seven days she can be... Uh, they can be with their mother, and then on the eighth day, they're to be given to the Lord. Well, let's let Scripture tell us what that means. In the book of Leviticus, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 26, and it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. From a prophet point of view, this doesn't make much sense, does it? The first male of uh, the uh, being born is offered to the Lord, verse 28, whether it is a cow or you, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. Well, why would God want the firstborn to be killed and offered as a sacrifice? Doesn't this kind of give us a picture of Jesus Christ in the new covenant? But in the Old Covenant, God said, the first of what you have belongs to me, even among living things. So the picture then given to us here is that God wants the first of what we have because it belongs to him. Now, a lot of times we, we, we argue about this tithing issue in the church. And we say, you know, the Old Testament teaches tithing, but the New Testament doesn't. It refers to it, but it doesn't teach it. Is it really an issue of tithing, or is it an issue of what belongs to God? And according to an old covenant point of view, the first of everything belongs to God. So the first of what we have, and we give it back to God, would take care of arguing about the issue of tithing. Well, let's go from the old covenant, which was very outwardly oriented, a very physical relationship, to the spiritual relationship. In the book of Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, it's talking about the church, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace. And I like the way it phrases it there. It doesn't tell us to do it. It says, let it be done to you, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let, permit it to be so, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, Cheryl, if you would back up to verse 15 for us, please. The last words of verse 15 are, be thankful. 
in verse 17, he says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. In other words, what he is talking about is Christian character and the development of Christian character in our lives. It's not we who are doing this. It is us letting it be done to us, letting the Word of God, letting the Spirit of God, letting those things happen to us because God is the potter and, and we are the clay, and be thankful in the process. But his whole point here in this passage is talking about the personal responsibility that we have of developing a Christ-like character inside of us. And if we let the Word of God, if we let the Spirit of God dwell in us richly, then these kinds of things are going to take place automatically. In the area of self-regeneration or self-reformation, we look at the Word and we say, okay, this is what a Christian would do. This is how I'm, what I'm supposed to say. This is how I'm supposed to think. This is how I'm supposed to feel. Therefore, this is what I'm going to do. Well, no, that's self-effort. And that's not what is being referred to here. Instead, he says, let God in your life do these things. You have the personal responsibility to let that happen in your life so that in word or in deed, you can do all in the name of Jesus Christ. The book of 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. It's a very important verse because oftentimes we say, I have a right. I need, you know, I need to do this. It's lawful for me. The Bible doesn't say anything about this. Well, that might be true, but not all things are helpful, not all things edify, and that's what ought to be looked at. And specifically in this passage, he's going to be talking about the concept of conscience. Not only our conscience, but the consciences of those around us. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, I can tell you from years of counseling experience that if husbands concentrated on their wives' well-being and wives concentrated on their husbands' well-being, I would never see anybody in the counseling office. If churches were this way and brothers and sisters within the church would concentrate on someone else's well-being as compared to their own, there would never be any disputes in the church. What a simple thing it would be if we did not seek our own, but we sought the well-being of another. Verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. Seeking the well-being of others instead of our own. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of? For the food over which I give thanks." Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, don't you find it interesting that he's been talking about our relationship to other people, and in our relationship to other people, that our prime objective is to bring glory to God by the things that we eat, by the things that we drink, by the things that we permit, and by the things that we do not. Verse 32, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You see, our relationship to other people is all about salvation. It's all about their salvation, their relationship to God, and our involvement within that. You see, if we're going to give the very best of what we have to the master, it means simply putting ourselves aside. Far too many times we find ourselves in very selfish places. Corey shared with us this, this morning about that selfishness and how all of us can get into that place of selfishness. And what, he, what he's talking about of giving God the very best of ourselves is giving permission, 
letting him work in our lives that we might be tools of righteousness and we might be involved in other people's lives. And if we're involved in other people's lives, to do so with their best interest in mind, their well-being. And if we were to do that, we would understand the glory of God in us and how we get to be a part of the glory of God. So giving of our best to the master means that our attitude towards other people would change. If I come to church on Sunday morning and my attitude isn't on others, my attitude will be on me and how you affect me and what you do give to me or what you don't give to me. And I will leave church saying they really didn't care about me. They didn't really speak to me. They didn't really care whether I was there or not. It's all about me. You see what Paul is saying here in the book of 1 Corinthians is that that needs to change. It needs to be, what do I have to offer? What can I give away? How can God work through me so that another person can walk closer to him in their salvation relationship? To give the best is to let go of ourselves. In the first part of what we read out of the book of Colossians, fourth chapter, third chapter, what he was talking about is our personal responsibility to develop the kind of character inside of us that is Christ-like. Well, he's going to switch gears here now in the 18th verse of that chapter, and he's going to talk about personal relationships. Notice what he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. That cannot be done unless there has been a character change inside of wives. They can't do this. You can't submit to your husband the way it would be pleasing to the Lord without the Lord's power. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Husbands cannot do this unless there is a character change, and that is by submission and surrender so that the Holy Spirit of God can empower them to be able to do that. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children cannot do that. You know, you know, the teenage years are the rebellious years of a person's life. And during those years, if you don't allow the Holy Spirit of God to change your character, mold, and shape you, you cannot do this no matter how hard you would try. Children, obey your parents. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a bond servant. I don't, I don't have a master here. Um, so this really probably doesn't fit us very much, does it? Well, yeah, I think it does. Because even though we're not bond servants, most of us are employees. And therefore, we have employers. And they would fit the master part, and we would fit the bond servant part. And he talks about a working relationship and the responsibility that we have towards others in that relationship. In order to be the kind of bondservant or employee that is pleasing to God, the very first thing is to submit and surrender so that God can do His thing in us, empower us to be pleasing to Him. Um, verse 23, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Now, this is the second time it's been repeated, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit more. Now, verse 24, Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, again, there's that equation thing. If you do this, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get inheritance. Oh, I like inheritance. Oh, I like salvation. Oh, I like eternity. Therefore, this is what I'm going to do. That's what we do when we're young in Christ, growing to a, a, an older level in our, our life in relationship to Christ. We already know that's going to take place, so we don't even concentrate on that. Instead, how can I be pleasing to God? And you know, in the first part, he said, it, developing the kind of character that is Christ-like. And then, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to talk about personal relationships that we have. I don't think he's repeated this the second time, it, just so that we would get the picture here, without understanding that in context, the first one applied to us as individuals, the second one applies to our relationships, that we should be doing in word or in deed, the, in our relationships, the kinds of things that would demonstrate who is in control of us. 
whatever you do in word or in deed, in your personal relationships. Do it heartily, even as unto the Lord. You know, that's the best, offering the best of who we are. The, the first one we were talking about is the first of what we have belongs to God. This one talks about the first of who we are belonging to God, manifested in a way that is going to be pleasing to our Heavenly Father, knowing that if it's pleasing to Him, we will be blessed beyond measure. But a third thing that we have in our life that we want to uh, give of the best of the Master to is this concept of worship. In the fourth chapter of John, Jesus was tired, and He went and sat down beside a well, and, and the Samaritan lady came up, and she was drawing water. And Jesus said, I, I want a drink. Would you give me a drink? And she said, excuse me, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and you don't talk to us. You don't even like us. Why are you asking me for something to drink? And Jesus goes on to tell her about him being the living water. And then he tells her about the relationships she's had with men and, and not, not husbands. And, and she says, I think that you must be a prophet. And, and, and she, she says to him, you know, we worship on the mountain, and you worship in Jerusalem. Where is the right place to worship? And Jesus answers her in verse 21 of chapter 4, and he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. All of a sudden, it's taken it away from the external, the behavioristic things, the, what we display on the outside, and brings it down to that personal relationship of our spirit to his spirit. Now, the word here for worship is a, a word that means bowing down. You know, I don't know, as I have ever bowed down before anyone or anything. Have you? Um, maybe you met the president and you bowed down before him. I, you know, I, I've never seen anybody do that, but I suppose it's possible. Or the governor, or somebody that's important in your life. You know, but I, I've never really bowed down. But people talk about worshiping Christmas trees. You know, I have never in all my years seen anybody bow down before a Christmas tree. Well, yes, I, I shouldn't say that. You bow down and get a present out from underneath the Christmas tree. But that's not the act of worship. The act of worship is bowing down before the thing that is more important to you and submitting and surrendering to that. And the picture that is given to us here is that what God is looking for is Christians who will do that in their spirit and do it in truth, bowing down before Him. Giving of your best to the Master means that you recognize that He is more important than I am, more important than you are. And in submission and surrender, saying, God, you are who I worship, and I bow down before you. Well, another key component of worship is given to us in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with the 28th verse, and we're going to go through 31. Then they reviled him. Oh, by the way, here's the story. We're talking about a blind guy here who was that way from birth, and, and, uh, the, and he comes to Jesus. And so Jesus takes some dirt, and he spits into it, rubs it like this and applies it to the guy's eyes and says, I want you to go to the pool of Siloam, and there I want you to, to wash it all off and you'll be able to see. Well, he did, and he did. And, and so he goes back to his neighbors and he says, wow, look at I can see. And some of his neighbors says, well, you look like the guy who we, we knew, but we're not sure it's you. He says, no, no, it's me. Well, how did this happen? He, so he recounts for them that Jesus spit into some dirt and took that clay and put it on on his eyelids and told him to go wash the pool of Siloam, and, and he did, and, and he could see. Well, the neighbors were pretty flabbergasted by this, so they haul him off to the Pharisees. And so he goes to the Pharisees, and they say, well, how did this happen? And well, you know, he recounted for them, Jesus spit into some dirt and wiped it on my eyes, told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and, and I would be able to see. And I did, and I see. And they said, well, you know, how, how can this be? 
uh, because this was a Sabbath day, and Jesus was performing miracles on the Sabbath day, and he said, how could a sinner, this guy's got to be a sinner, because he's doing this on the Sabbath day, how could a sinner do such things? Well, they're perplexed by this, and they're really not sure this is the miracle, so they call for his parents. And his parents come, and, and they say, is this your son? And they say, yep, that's our son, sure enough. Well, how did this get to be like this? And they said, why don't you ask him? He's old enough to tell you. And so they ask him again, and he says, I already told you what took place. Why, why are you asking me this? Do you want to become his disciples? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, and Pharisees really get irritated by this. Well, let's pick up in verse 28. Then they reviled him. You know, how dare you say this to us? We're, we're the big wheels here. Uh, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. You know, and they're, they're pulling the trump card here. Verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Goes on in verse 30, man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Verse 31, now we know that God does not hear sinners. That's a pretty important passage, eh? If, if you don't have this underlined in your Bible, you need to underline it. While we are in sin, God does not hear us, whether you are a Christian or not. For we know that God does not hear sinners, except in repentance. But if anyone is a worshiper of God, a true worshiper of God, he does his will and he hears him. You know, in times past, we've refer, referred to what we do here as a worship service. And uh, there are worship leaders, and they do worship songs. And when you come here, it's so that you can worship. Um, that's not true. You know, you, you can sing the songs and not even be thinking about God. You can be in the prayer session and not even be thinking about God. We can be reading from His Word, and you can be thinking about Super Bowl this afternoon doesn't mean just because you're here in this place that this is a worship service or that you will worship. Why? Well, because the first component that was given to us by Jesus was that only those who are going to worship him in spirit and truth are worshipers of God. Then he goes on to reveal to us here that true worshipers of God are those who are being obedient to the will of God. Being obedient. Not not disobedient, not almost getting there, not saying someday I'm going to deal with my sin or I'm, I'm working on my sin. Those who are obedient are the true worshipers of God. So we could come here this morning and have some unresolved sin in our life. And, and we could raise our hands and we could bow our heads. Tears could roll from our eyes as we sang songs of worship to the Lord. And we would not be a worshiper of God because we're not being obedient and our words fall on empty ears because he does not hear those who are found in sin, whether they be one of his children or not. Look at First Chronicles 16 chapter. Here's the reason why we are worshipers of God. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory do His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before Him in holiness. Bow down before Him sin-free. Bow down before Him recognizing that He is the one who has given us life, that He paid the price so that we could have that kind of life. All that we are in our worship belongs to Him. When we come to church, sometimes we can deceive ourselves into believing that we are worshipers of God. Sometimes in our private lives, we can deceive ourselves into believing that we're worshipers of God. We can say, I have five minutes here, so I will take that five minutes and pray. And I prayed a little prayer when I got up this morning, and I've talked to God all day long, and 
Therefore, I've prayed without ceasing. And, and uh, I, I studied my Bible for my care group lesson. I studied my Bible for Thursday morning Bible study. I studied my Bible for my Sunday school class, and, and therefore I, I'm becoming a student of the Word. And in reality, we're giving Him leftovers of our time, our energy, who we are, and what God wants is to be first in our life in every area. What is God saying to you this morning, and what will you answer? Lord, in humility, we bow before you to recognize that we can be overcome by the things of the world, that we can get to the place in our lives to where we're giving you leftovers, deceiving ourselves into believing that we've put you first. So, Lord, I, I thank you for the conviction that I have experienced in my life of not putting you first, of giving you leftovers. And I'm praying for each and every one of us here today that that same spirit of conviction fall upon us. And in the process of that, the potter can change us into vessels of honor. That we can take one more step to you and experience more of you. For that is our heart's desire. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.